Welcome to season five of How I Made It Through, and thank you for joining us. I have invited Ray Catania, author, metaphysical teacher, and coach to join me as my co-host as we aim to engage, challenge, inspire, and teach you, our listeners, what it really means to be a spiritual being having a human experience. We'll explore not just concepts, but attempt to unravel the neuroscience of metaphysics, as well as practices designed to expand consciousness, increase healing, and develop a profound connection to love. We'll explore God, death, the afterlife, and pushing past limitations as we encourage you to break free of the trance of fear so that you may experience greater freedom, peace, and connection to yourselves, each other, and spirit. Hey, Betty. Hi. How are Hi. you? Grateful to connect with you guys today. Nice to meet you. Yes, you as well. That's really great. I've heard so many amazing things about you. I checked out your Instagram. I have your bio. Nice. <laughs> I'm here to learn a lot and to make sure that your story is uh, told in a way that it makes a big difference because I can't imagine that it won't. And actually, four awesome. days ago, I, d- I was on Betty's show, right? Was it yeah. two days ago, three days ago, something like know. that? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very cool. I'm just going to be really honest with you. I've had no sleep. I have a teenager and you know how challenging life can be. So I'm like, that's what you're being uh, met with. Thank today. God you didn't have one of us. Wait till you hear it. <laughs> I was just telling, I was just telling Courtney, I'm like, she's probably the perfect <laughs> guest to have right now because I need a little perspective and inspiration. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Welcome. To how I made it through, Betty Guadagno's journey commenced amidst shadows of adversity, grappling with the weight of drug addiction, involvement in sex work, and the heart-rending loss of her parents to suicide. However, a profound turning point emerged in March 2019 following a near-death-like experience due to a drug overdose. During this awakening, Betty experienced a life review. She was greeted by loved ones and that had crossed over and was shown her divine mission. It was here that she was guided through her pre-birth planning, igniting her revelation within her. She was not merely a passive victim of circumstance, but an active co-creator of her own reality. Upon her return to Earth, she felt as though she had undergone a profound rebirth. Today, Betty's passion is fueled by a desire to forego meaningful connections and inspire positive change, demonstrating that transformation is attainable regardless of one's starting point. Residing in Brooklyn, New York, Betty serves as a guide and mentor, as a life coach, podcast host, and an event coordinator for IAMS, the International Association of Near-Death Experiences. So once again, welcome and wow. Welcome. Yeah, chat GPT is like amazing, right? It sounds so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave him a lot of good material to work with, I tell you what. Um, where do you think the starting point is when you tell your story? And I'm sure you've told it many times. I think... Painting a picture of what the past is like is really important to be able to show the contrast of transformation. So really a story of a caterpillar, this kind of earth dwelling grub, like living in the mud, and then what the transformation process is like to actually becoming a butterfly. And I never knew that we were meant to become these beautiful winged creatures. I thought that we just suffer and eat mud for the rest of our, you know, for our whole existence. So I could share some of the beginning. If that's good, we'll start there. And it's a trigger warning for anybody listening. My life is quite traumatizing. But again, the really cool thing about it is that there is hope and there's freedom from the bondage of victimhood and suffering. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in this really chaotic, dysfunctional environment. My whole family is this perpetual cycle of addiction and poverty and sexual trauma and abuse, physical, mental, any kind of abuse that you could imagine happened in my household and within my family as I was growing up. And I knew that my parents were addicts at a very young age because I watched them deal with life circumstances, like not having enough money to pay the rent or getting evicted or losing their jobs over and over and over again. And any time that an event like that happened, I would watch them take a pill or smoke something, or drink something, and their whole attitude and behavior changed. It was like the pain that they were experiencing just disappeared. 
And I made all these mental notes as a young child. And I said, as soon as I'm able to get my hands on whatever it is that they have, I'm going to do the same thing because I don't want to feel the feelings that I'm feeling either. And that's exactly what I did. I start, I, I think the first time I ever tried a cigarette, I was 10 years old. Alcohol was probably around the same age. Just looking to come outside of myself. I became very obsessed with boys at a very young age. I just wanted someone to rescue me from what my life was. And so I thought that I had to find things outside of myself to make that happen. I watched my parents' addiction progress over the course of their lives. And in 2007, my parents made this decision that they were done using drugs. They were done with being poor. They were done with all the pain in their lives. And they were ready to do something different. But they didn't know how to make change. And so the only thing that they knew to do was that if they died, all of that would stop. And so in 2007, my parents committed suicide together. They intentionally overdosed. And I mean, there's no words for what something like that is like. But my sister and I found them and they left these really short notes and they didn't really say anything except to take care of each other. And uh, in that moment that my parents died, my addiction stepped in and it became my parent. It was very loud. It was almost like I could feel it. Like it was a whole nother entity standing next to me with its hand on my shoulder saying, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never abandon you the way that they did. It's me and you together forever. I abandoned my sister. I just, she was 18 years old. I was 23. I said, I can't deal with this. And I just left her. And I moved across the country because I just wanted to be with me in my addiction. And in 2019, I experienced a drug overdose. Surprise, I took too many drugs. Who would have ever thought? And that's when I had my spiritually transformative experience. And I, I call it a near-death-like experience because I never had a doctor tell me that I was dead. I was never pronounced dead or anything like that. But I did hit all of the markers of a common near-death experience. The first part of my experience was I started into a life review. And I'm not just a person who experienced trauma in my life. I am a traumatized person who maliciously, intentionally traumatized other people. I went to great lengths to make sure that people felt as miserable in their experience as I felt in my life. So in my life review, it was really dark because I was experiencing not only the experience from my point of view, but also from the person's point of view of the people that I had harmed in my life. And then I began to experience my parents' suicide, not only from the experience of a grieving daughter, but from their perspective. And I mean, the ocean of anguish and despair, it felt like every cell in my body was covered in spikes and static and concrete. And I was being so weighted down in this ocean of despair. It felt like drowning. It felt like I would have done anything to make that feeling stop. And I know that that's how they must have felt before they did what they did as well. Mm -hmm. And it was just so dark and it was all consuming. And then I began to experience Everything that's ever happened on earth, every emotion, every experience, war, uh, childbirth, your child dying, uh, despair, joy, elation, experiences that I had never experienced in my life, but I know are part of our collective's experience here on earth. And it was so much all at once. It was like being completely cracked open and just every little ounce of information that's ever existed was being shoved into my head. And I just felt the anguish was really the predominant feeling. Like these feelings that we have here of suffering are just so consuming. And then I started to hear these masculine voices and they were calling out to me <clears throat> and they were saying, you are worthy of all the love in the universe. You are worthy of all the love in the universe. And so I started to follow the voices. And one of the voices was my father's voice. And so it was familiar to me. So I felt safe following it. And then I kind of landed on the deck of a spaceship and I was surrounded by thousands of other souls. And I saw us as our light bodies. So kind of looking like human form, but nothing but light, no features, nothing to see. And 
And I was downloaded with the awareness of the great awakening. And I was told that I am a divine spiritual soldier sent to earth on a mission to uplift the consciousness of the planet. And that's what I'm doing with all of these other souls that I'm surrounded by. And then my awareness shifted over to a table of beings and they had this giant book and they were thumbing through it. And they told me that it was good to see me. I'm not meant to stay. I'm only there for information. And I was like looking all around me. I'm like, you guys aren't talking to me, right? Because I don't know where I am, but I'm definitely staying. <laughs> I like it here. It feels way better than where I just was. And I'm definitely not going back there. And they, they just kept thumbing through the book and affirming, no, 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 you're only here for information. And then they took me through the details of my pre-birth plan. And the way that it looked in my mind's eye was that I was in this gigantic grocery store. And there was a man leading me and he had this big empty grocery cart and lining the walls of the grocery store aisles were these gigantic cereal boxes. And every cereal box had a life experience on it. And I start grabbing every cereal box I can put my hands on. I need everyone up. Prostitution, degradation, homelessness, addiction, poverty, picking my parents, picking the family line that I would be born into. And the one event that really sticks out for me very vividly that I always feel very called to share is when I picked the life experience of childhood sexual trauma and the box came off the shelf, a little orb of light came out with the box. And that orb of light was the soul of the man who would molest me as a small child. And we came orb to orb with each other in contract to play these roles in each other's lives. Now, my human mind cannot understand how childhood sexual trauma could evolve me as a spirit. But today I have this unwavering faith that I don't need to know why or how. I just know I have this deep-seated faith that it's all working out for my highest good and for the collective's highest good. And I saw the reasons that this man and I were coming into contract with each other. One of the main reasons was that in a previous incarnation, I had been his abuser in the same capacity. And so in this lifetime, we were balancing the scales for each other. And then another one of the reasons was for this great collective shift that we're about to experience, this download of the Great Awakening, that my soul was taking on challenges that many people in our collective have to deal with. So as I heal my own sexual trauma, I'm healing for every little girl who never got an opportunity to heal from hers before she left form. And so it gives me this great sense of pride to be able to take on like these huge life challenges and know that I'm not just healing for me because if I thought that it was just for me, I might just quit. I don't think that I'm that important. But if I think about some newborn baby who I'm healing for, then I'm a little bit more motivated towards it. And so in the moment of being downloaded with my pre-birth plan, it was like two tons of bondage had been released from me. I'm no longer a victim to my circumstance. I'm actually a divine co-creator of my experience. How amazing is that? I don't have to feel like the world is out to get me. I constructed this world with the help of the divine. And so I come back in front of the table of beings and I'm so grateful and I'm down on my knees and I'm sobbing and I'm so happy to have this information and I'm telling them this. And then I kind of look up and I'm like, I'm still not going back to earth. Thank you, Ryan. So much. <laughs> I bought a one-way ticket and I'm staying. I'm like, I'm going to grab my PJs and a bowl of popcorn. I'm going to watch the show from up here. I think it's going to be really great, but I'm done. <laughs> and they were like, no, you, you have to go back. You know, they're like, we're not sending you back as a punishment. This is a mission that you signed up for and you just have to complete it. And they told me that the first part of my life was boot camp and that the second part of my life would be carrying out the mission and it wouldn't be nearly as challenging because I would have divine soulmates and kindred spirits and mentors and teachers and that I was going to be okay. And again, I just refused. I was like, absolutely not. You cannot make me go back. You don't tell us what earth is actually like. And I absolutely refuse to go back there. And they said, okay, well, you don't have to go back into the body that you just came from, but you do most certainly have to go back. And so we're going to show you the baby that you'll be born into. 
and they showed me this little baby and it looked a lot like a video game. I saw all of her stats next to her avatar. So they showed me her charisma level, her personality type, the parents that she would be born to, the location she would be born to, her gender, her ethnicity, and that she was going to be taking on my life experience cart. So I kind of saw the cart there with her avatar and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to do all those life experiences from zero all over again. I'm like, there's no way. I, if these are really my only options, getting reborn or going back into the body that I came from, I'm just going to go back into the body that I came from. And they sent me back on my way and they just kept saying to me as I was drifting back into my awareness, just trust us. It's not going to be nearly as bad. Just trust us. And I was like, I do not trust you guys, whatever. <laughs> I came back into my body and I just wrote the holding off as drug induced psychosis because all I knew was that I took a bunch of drugs and then I thought I was talking to God and like this was not part of my picture I was a militant atheist I had gone through a lot of adversity in my life I didn't want to believe in a creator that would allow those kinds of things to happen to me and so I just wrote the whole experience off and I just went about my life living it the way that I was prostituting myself, using drugs, manipulating people, causing lots and lots of harm. And then the universe stepped in in this beautiful synchronistic way to get me onto my path. My world became so narrow. It became impossible for me to keep living my life the way that I was. One of the things that happened was all of my drug dealers that I had been dealing with for over a decade all simultaneously decided to change their lives and stop selling substances. And it was really as if the universe was orchestrating itself to get me onto this path of recovery, reprogramming, spiritual awakening, and to recognize that my experience was a true one. So is that what led you to your own reform, to go to rehab or whatever you had to do to get rid of the drugs was the fact that you were like, all these people are doing it and maybe there's something to what I saw. I need so, to do this too. Yeah. You know, I experienced a spontaneous healing. So that was kind of my big, huge, like, girl, it's for real. Let's mm. do it. Because uh, I was addicted to opiates for over, I used drugs for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I was a heroin addict for all of those years, you know, whether it was First, it was prescriptions from a doctor, and then one day pills became heroin. But I couldn't stop using drugs because I had this physical dependency to this one particular substance, I, along with a dozen other mental addictions to other substances. And so I was so sick because not only did all my dealers stop dealing, then I was trying to find drugs in other places, and those drugs weren't working. And uh -huh. so I, I just knew that it was something was going on, and I was laying in my bed, and I was so sick. I mean, Ugh. thicker than I had ever been in 20 plus years of using. Wow. And then I heard this voice and it said that I could request what I wanted fixed. And I was in the throes of desperation. So I was like, okay, strange voice. I want to no longer be physically dependent on this one substance. I didn't say that I wanted to be rid of my drug addiction because I still definitely wanted to use other drugs. I just didn't want to have this one substance be part of my life anymore. And they told me to lay back, count backwards from 10. And as I closed my eyes, I saw these two little men appear in my mind's eye. And they were wearing these white lab coats and they had these little lawn mowers. And I watched these men walk through every crevice of my mind. And as they did, I felt these intense hot tingles start to take over the whole crown of my head. And when they were finished walking through what I assume is the neural pathways inside my mind, they, they stopped. They just kind of like waved. I still see them every time I tell this story. They're like, we're still here. Whatever you need a little tune up, you just let us know. Um, and then there was this plunger that came onto the crown of my head. And as it plunged down and back up, this huge white light came over me. And in that moment, I was instantaneously healed out of day three of heroin withdrawal, which is the absolute worst day when you're sick all over yourself. It felt like my skin was made of broken glass and that my bones were made of hot lava and fire. And then all of a sudden I was completely well and healed and completely fine. And I threw myself out of bed and I fell onto my knees and I was crying out to the divine. And I was saying, how could this be happening? I don't believe in this. I don't believe in you. 
You could not have picked a more unworthy subject to bestow this kind of grace on. I was a militant atheist, an orphan to suicide. I was a liar, a manipulator, a thief. I was a racist. I was a rapist. I was a pimp. I was a degenerate. I was a derelict. And there I was, completely loved and showered in the grace of unconditional love. And after that, my, my path started to become much more clear. I mean, first, I thought that I was the second coming of Christ. I was like, oh, my God, I have the ability to heal people with just my hands. And I was like going out on the streets of New York City on the subway, like laying my hands on homeless drug addicts. It was crazy. I'm but I believe it. I believe it, though. You had just experienced something that could be so deemed crazy. Why would that not be the logical execution of now this is how I move through the world? That was how my brain went. It was like yeah. self-deprecation to delusions of grandeur. I am Christ. Yeah. The end. And, um, and it took me a while to like have the dust settle, but I knew that recovery was going to have to be what I did. And it is what I did. I went into a long-term treatment facility for a year and a half. I stayed inpatient and I just used that time. I didn't have access to a cell phone or a computer for 18 months. So I just used that time to read books, totally archaic. I felt like a caveman and that's how I learned. So Betty, I have a question because Listening to your extraordinary story, it could also logically follow that you go into this long-term treatment plan, you share these experiences that you've had, and they think, oh, she's schizophrenic, she's psychotic, she's bipolar, let's drug the crap out of her. How did that not happen? That is such a good question. So one of the things that happened to me before I went into the long-term treatment center was I kept going to the psych ward because I didn't know what was happening to me. And I sat with the director of psychiatry and I tried to explain to him what happened in the best way that I could, even though I really had no language for what was going on. I just told him, hey, listen, I died and I'm trying to get back to heaven. Do you know how I can get back there? And, you know, he said, I think that maybe you've reached a level of consciousness that I can't comprehend. Mm -hmm. And no. it's very no. good for him. Where but did also, you find that, doctor? Yeah. Well, I think that part of some people's pre-birth plan is to come up against that Western medicine problem yes. where they get institutionalized, they get over-medicated, they get these diagnoses. Not part of my particular plan, although I had lots of other things in my pre-birth plan. You so were for me. That never became a problem. Although it always seemed like the universe was sending me these little signs. Like when I was in treatment, they gave us this questionnaire one day, totally random. And it said, do you think that songs on the radio speak to you? And then it said, like, all, like do you see messages and numbers? And I was like, this is crazy. They're trying to institutionalize me. And I got really scared. But I also knew that I was divinely guided and that no more harm was ever going to come to me. I believe what the beings of light told me. They told me that the second part of my life wasn't going to be nearly as challenging as the first. So just kind of gone through this part of my life thinking like, I'm over the hard stuff. Nothing bad's going to happen. And even if something that was less than desirable did happen, there's a meaning and a purpose for it. So I had just come into a state of acceptance around it. Yeah. Uh, That's, wow. That is the state of acceptance around it. Like what you just said is so huge. Because I, I had a similar past story. It's a mess and you know that. And um, the best days of my life were the worst days of my life. And it's because those are the days I learned the most. It's the days I showed my character. It's the days I, I really shine through. And I think that you get exactly what I'm saying because you yeah, did yeah. the same thing. We can look at the great days and say, well, you know, those are easy. They just came to us. But the ones when we had a fight, when we had to dig deep and we had to come overcome that, now we can help others overcome that, that those were our greatest days. Yeah. And I think that's a great point. And the thing is, is that if I don't stay in some sort of service towards people who are still in the mess or they're still in their perceived suffering, I can very easily forget. You know, like I used to be homeless. Now I have a beautiful home. Do I want to take this for granted and just be like, God, my air conditioner is just not cooling my apartment. Because yeah. I can get <laughs> real petty like that. Yeah. 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 And I've yeah. slept on subway trains before. And that can happen mm -hmm. to me in a second. Sure. So I stay involved in service. I belong to 12-step fellowship. I do service in different spiritual communities. 
I have a job of service. I work as a recovery coach at a clinic during the day. I work as a transformation coach in a private practice by myself. But I think that it's so important to constantly see that mirror of the past version of myself or the future version of myself if I'm not vigilant in what I'm doing. My recovery is a spiritual discipline, but I do have to stay vigilant in all of this, in my spiritual development, in my recovery development, all of it. It's right. a lifestyle, right? It becomes a lifestyle, not, not, you know, not something that you do and then you stop. Like you say, it becomes the, uh, the way you live. Yeah, daily practice. So I want to ask you about this great collective awakening. Can you say more about that? Yes. So my download was very loud and clear that uh, we're in the midst of transformation, that our collective is ascending from a level of third dimensional thinking to fifth dimensional thinking. So in other words, we're going from an ego-centered thought system to a God-service, spirit-centered thought system, whatever language resonates for you. So basically, we're going from living a life of self-centeredness to a life led by spiritual principles. Spiritual principles being honesty, open-mindedness, willingness, tolerance, patience, unconditional love. So in order to make those things happen, they can happen all throughout the day. You know, I, could, uh, I do believe that we are going to have like one sort of big collective kick where we sort of ascend into this level of thinking together. But some of us are already in that space. So 3D being self-centered, 4D being the awareness, and 5D being the God-centeredness. So I can start my day very God-centered. I wake up, I do a gratitude list in my head, I pray, I meditate. I go drink water. I speak affirmation into it. I talk about all the things I want to manifest in my day. Then I leave my apartment, get on the New York City subway system. I miss the train. I'm cursing God and the universe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that. I love the humanity of it. All of my spiritual practice is out the window, but I, I started my day that way. And again, it's a muscle. So I'm getting in the practice and I can start my day over whenever I want. So it's not about being perfect. It's not about being God-centered every second of the day. I'm here to have a human experience. The human experience is about a whole multitude of emotions, but I don't need to stay in suffering or anger or angst or fear at all. I can choose to transcend those lower vibrational energies and stay in a high vibration. And so for the collective, I believe that that's what's happening. You know, there's so much stuff coming into our awareness. We're in the middle of a birth cycle, so it's very uncomfortable. So what's so interesting about that, because I've been hearing that from multiple sources, and I'd love to get your take on it. Some people are saying it is the collective, meaning all of us will move from 3D, 4D, 5D, right? And then some people are saying, no, there are multiple states of consciousness, depending on your life path, your soul's contract. Some people will remain 3D. Some people will, and they're all living on the same earth plane, but it's a different sort of awareness or consciousness that some will elevate, but it won't happen all at once for everyone. What is your point? Yeah. Well, okay. So I have a couple of different things around this. So I'm a teacher and a student of A Course in Miracles, which is a metaphysical text channeled by Jesus. It's a reprogramming. And in A Course in Miracles, it teaches us that this world that we live in is not real. And that these bodies that we inhabit are also not real. And you'll hear this in lots of different spiritual teachings as well. Like Leela, the Hindu cosmic play that we're a part of. We're actors and actresses. So there's some people that are extras in the play of life. Uh, I don't think it's not. I feel like when people hear that idea that some people are going to stay 3D and some people are going to ascend, then they think that that's rapture. Or they think that there's some like they're not going to see their loved ones anymore if they don't convince them to be spiritual. Yeah, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, that's that's I've heard that before. So mm-hmm. I think that the idea around this ascension is just about having different thoughts. We're all going to come into the awareness that we don't have to let our thoughts dictate our experience. That we can choose to have more spirit-centered thoughts on a daily basis. So. You know, it's and everything is a story. So whenever a story makes your life better, that's the story for you. For me, the story around the Great Awakening is very hopeful for me because I know that if I have an awakening, uh, everybody's going to have one. Okay, I went from (laughs) zero awareness. I had never heard any of these words. I didn't know that there was information out there about the Great Awakening. 
these were words that were downloaded into my being in my spiritual experience. And I thought that I sounded totally crazy when I came back trying to explain what I had seen and what I had heard. And now I know that there's so many other people out there who have the exact same awareness as me. And again, this is a story like and the story can shift as well. Like when I came back from my experience, I was really into the concept of light workers and star seeds. And I wanted to meet my galactic family. And that was something that made me feel so much better because I thought, well, I know that I'm not from Earth because nobody would be from this ghetto place. So <laughs> where am I actually from? Yeah. And I just wanted to know about origins. And so those stories really helped me with that. And, you know, again, they're, they are, they're stories. Everything mm -hmm. is, everything in this Everything is a story. Everything is a story. So my stories have changed. I, I subscribe to different stories today. I still feel very called to all that cool sort of science fiction way of looking at it. It makes it so fun. Uh, but I also do recognize the fact that these are a bunch of stories that we're telling each other. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So if you can believe it, because I could listen to you, I keep going, God, I wish I weren't the podcast host right now. And I just want to like, keep going. Someone else has the question. We could do this for a weekend. I, <laughs> that, I've... I know. I know. So I have to say, if you're enjoying the story and I can't imagine that you aren't, please like subscribe, um, share really helps the channel, helps these stories to help people who really need to hear this. Um, you get to the end of your life again. What will have made it most meaningful and what is a meaningful life? Wow. For me, I think the most meaningful thing would be my connection to other people. I'm, I'm immersed in spiritual community today. I am surrounded by the members of my soul family in human form. And that has been the most amazing part of my human experience since my awakening. And also being able to really be able to see the contrast in the human experience, to know yeah. that I've lived two lifetimes in one lifetime. So I think at the end of my life this time around, I'm going to be immensely grateful for the spiritual connections that I've made to other people and allowing myself to be receptive to letting new people into my life. I feel like so many people experience isolation and they feel so alone in the spiritual awakening journey, in their recovery journeys. And there's just a whole world of people waiting out there to support you and love you. So I think yeah. that's something that I've found that's really been amazing for me. That is amazing. And it's such a perfect segue. How do people find you, connect with you, learn from you, work with you? So I'm on all social media. My handle on everything is Buddha Betty. It's a play on word. And I, I would I would love to connect with anyone, uh, especially if you're dealing with anything with addiction or any sort of trauma that you're trying to overcome. I've practiced so many different tools to be able to heal myself. And so I would love to share some of those with you. Um, also, would love to connect you to some greater spiritual communities. I'm really involved in 12 step fellowship. And I would love to, to usher you to maybe find a spiritual home for yourself with some people that you resonate with. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, for your story. It's just amazing, amazing and an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much. How I Made It Through is produced and distributed by EIQ Media, LLC. Elevate your emotional IQ with podcasts and content focused on overcoming adversity, leadership, mental health, entrepreneurship, spiritually transformative experiences, and more.